This is the Lumberjack TS1800 10 inch table saw, a machine which I've been keen to have a look at for a few years now. And in this video, I'm gonna show you everything you could possibly want to know about it and explain why I think this is almost my dream table saw and also where I think it falls short. Before we get into the review though, first a quick bit of background. Back in August 2020, I decided I wanted to invest in a cast iron cabinet saw for my workshop, upgrading from my previous sight saws, the DeWalt DW745 and the Milwaukee FTS210, which I still have and use when I need a portable saw. I made a video all about deciding which new machine looked the best option based on the information that I could find online. In that video, I mentioned that the Lumberjack TS1800 looked an interesting option, but that there was very little information online about it. And at the time, I and a few other content creators reached out to Lumberjack to see if we could arrange some sort of deal so that we could review the saw and show our viewers what it's capable of. But Lumberjack never responded to me or any of us. And that put me off because I'm not about to spend loads of money on a machine that I know almost nothing about. Plus, if a tool company ignores my message before I even buy the machine, it doesn't fill me with confidence that they'll be around to offer customer support should I experience any issues with it later down the line. So I ended up buying this, the Axminster AT254SB, and I did a full detailed review of this saw, which I'll leave a link to in the description box, and I've been using it ever since. If I was going to summarize my review in a sentence, I would say it's a good, solid and reliable machine that lacks a lot of useful features and has terrible dust extraction. So bad in fact that I have to use two extractors at all times when using it, a vacuum extractor that's hooked up to the crown guard and an HVLP extractor that's hooked up to the cabinet. Since then, this particular machine has been discontinued by Axminster. Fast forward to January 2023 and Matt from Badger Workshop and I were having a bit of a rant, as we often do on the Workshop Banter podcast, this time about things that we wish existed. And a compact table saw with good features and a cast iron table was high on both of our lists. We mentioned in the show that the Lumberjack TS1800 might be the closest match, but that neither of us had ever managed to get hands on with it. Lumberjack then got in touch with us in the comment section of that video. I think they've upped their customer services game recently, and they invited us to come and see the machine at various woodworking shows or at their showroom in Wolverhampton. I told them that I wasn't about to travel hundreds of miles to see it, especially because I now already have a saw that does everything that I need it to do. But I said, if you want to send me one, then I'd happily set it up, use it for a few weeks and make a video about it. And a few days later, a pallet arrived. So let's take a look. So this saw is imported to the UK by Lumberjack. And as I understand it, it's the same saw as the rigid R4512, which is available in the USA, but with adaptations made to it, like a UK plug being fitted, a metric measurement scale for the fence and a gray and red spray job to the body rather than the bright orange. And it's kind of a hybrid saw sitting somewhere between portable site style saws and cabinet saws because it comes with its own built-in mobile base. Looking inside the body of the saw from underneath, first impressions were very good. It looked simple, but in a good way. Less to go wrong if you know what I mean. 1800 watt induction motor on the left, nice chunky looking threaded rods for the gears to run on, and very thick chunky metal internal components that surpassed my expectations. I bolted together the pressed steel base and then assembled the pedal operated wheel base. This giant dust hood with a 100mm port, which fits between the saw cabinet and the base, seems such a great idea. So much better than the awful design of the dust port on my Axminster saw, and we'll find out how effective this is later on. But don't do what I did and fit it upside down, as that's just creating unnecessary work for yourself later on, when you have to disassemble it again in order to flip it over the right way. I'm an idiot. This saw is extremely heavy, so this should be a two person job, but I got by using blocks of wood to help me flip it up and onto its base. The cast iron top looked pretty good, but after cleaning off all the grease, there was one area of the table where the surface looked a little different. Not sure why, but it doesn't really matter to me anyway. The edges of the cast iron table have been filed pretty crudely to be honest. However, at least those sharp edges have had some kind of treatment, unlike the table that came with my Axminster saw, where I had to file the sharp edges myself, as they were so sharp you could easily cut yourself on them. One of my favourite features is the adjustable height riving knife, which is completely toolless. You just unlock it via the knob, and then there's a latching switch that holds it in place. A brilliant feature, well executed. This saw has quite a long arbor on it, meaning it can take a dado stack. Some woodworkers will really like that. 
It's not something I would use myself though, as I'm quite happy using my six millimeter flat ground tooth blade for that, but it's nice to have the option, I suppose. One downside though, is that the Arbor measures five eighths of an inch or 15.8 millimeters. And the blades that are available here in the UK usually have a 30 millimeter bore. So that's a bit disappointing. You do get a 5 eighths of an inch bore blade with the saw and Lumberjack also sells these blades in 40, 60 and 80 tooth versions. But I prefer to use blades that I'm already familiar with and know are high quality, especially for the purposes of this review so that I can compare my experiences reliably. Luckily though, I had some bore reduction ring adapters that came in this packet with a spare blade, so I can reduce that 30 millimeter bore to 5 eighths of an inch. These adapters work fine in my experience, but it is still a bit of a pain, especially as they're small and they can easily go missing. Another feature I really like though is this toolless spindle lock, meaning you can just press a button to lock it and tighten with the provided spanner. These angle and blade height adjustment wheels are metal too and also really well designed. This one is sprung loaded and you tighten the knob to lock it in and spin the wheel to raise and lower the blade. It's really smooth in operation too. I was a bit worried that the internals of the saw weren't very accessible for cleaning or maintenance but then I discovered that the back panel simply unscrews and that actually gives you plenty of space to do any work you need to do inside the saw. Now to get the fence rails fitted which slide onto these bolt heads that get fixed to the front and back of the cast iron table. Fitting the front ones are easy, fitting the ones at the back was quite fiddly because there's a very narrow gap between the table and cabinet making it tricky to manoeuvre and line up the nut and washer with the bolt, but not a major problem. Before tightening the bolts I can get my side tables fitted. These are pressed steel so nothing fancy but they do the job. It would be good if there were optional cast iron tables available to purchase separately for this saw, but I don't believe there are. These get bolted to the table and fence rail. Once all the nuts and bolts are tightened, it's actually pretty rigid and solid, so no issues there. And there's a bar that can be added to lock the fence rails together at the end, helping to stiffen things up even more. I'm checking with my calipers to see if the blade is correctly aligned to the table and it's measuring 107.32 mil from the blade to the mitre slot at the front. And I'm going to mark the same tooth and spin it to the back and measure again where I got 107.47, a difference of 0.15 millimeters. For some of you, I'm sure that's not acceptable and would need adjustment. And that can be done by loosening the bolts which secure the blade and motor housing to the table. But for me and for the work I do, I think it'll be fine. The Biesemeyer style fence that comes with the saw was not set up properly out of the box. It was really tight on the rails to the point where it couldn't be moved left or right. Fortunately, it was really easy to adjust with these two screws on the front of the fence and I had it fitting and operating nicely in no time. Really well designed and intuitive to adjust. And once it's locked down, it's nice and solid too, securing to both the front and back fence rails. These screws are also used to align the fence parallel to the blade. This is a great design and it works well, much better than the fence on my Axminster, which requires adjustment of four small Allen key bolts. The problem with that design is that you get the fence right where you want it and then as soon as you tighten the bolts, the fence moves a little, which makes for a really frustrating experience and makes setting the fence up on the Axminster far more time consuming than it needs to be. There's a further adjustment at the back of the fence to set the tension of the fence lever. The fence also has a perpendicular adjustment to get the fence square to the table. And again, this is well thought out and adjustments are simple and quick to make via two Allen keys. Mine was a little bit off out of the box, but really easy to get it square. Rip capacity to the right of the blade is 760 millimeters, impressive for such a compact saw. To the left of the blade, the measuring tape shows a maximum of 340, but the fence goes beyond that, so it's actually more like 360. In comparison to the fence on my Axminster, while the Lumberjack fence doesn't quite have the more premium feel when moving the fence left and right, largely due to the wheel that's fitted to the back of the fence that runs on the back rail on the Axminster, but aside from that, I actually prefer the fence on the Lumberjack for how intuitive it is to set up, its ease of adjustment and a superior measurement marker. More on that later. I can see myself potentially getting confused about what window I should be looking at when setting the fence though. And as I don't recall ever positioning my fence on the left hand side of the blade, I think I'll just cover up the other window with some gaffer tape for now to stop me making any mistakes. 
Another minor issue that I found was that because the measurement ruler was already secured to the fence, you need to align the zero position with the marker on the fence. I did this by making a pencil mark on the table and then getting it as close as possible by jiggling it around on the bolts, and it took a few attempts to get this right. I think it would have been better if the measuring tapes were provided separately in the box for the user to stick onto the rails themselves. One of the fence rails has these alignment pins in the end, and this is another really well thought out piece of design, and it worked perfectly. These measurement markers on the fence have a really generous amount of fine tuning in them too, to enable you to get them really dialed in perfectly. The marker is very clear and easy to read, and again this is far superior to the marker on my Axminster saw, which isn't clear to read at all, as the marker sits several millimetres above the rail, meaning that the measurement that you read changes depending on what angle you look at it, so you really need to be careful to ensure that you're looking down on it perfectly plumb. I found that marker on the Axminster really annoying. Let's take a look at the included mitre gauge. I've used and reviewed so many different machines over the years and not a single one of them has come provided with a mitre gauge that actually fits the mitre slot snugly. So let's just get this disappointment over with. Hang on a minute though, what are those? At first glance, these slots in the bar got me excited as I thought that these hex screws were there to adjust the fit in the mitre slot. I was so excited in fact that I even planned a little comedy skit around it and everything. So why have you brought me all this way? The mitre gauge fits the mitre slot. F off. <laughs> <laughs> but on closer inspection, it wasn't to be. These hex screws are actually there to lift the height of the bar, to get it flush with the table, and I can't for the life of me fathom why this might even be useful. So please let me know in the comments if you can think of a reason. If anything, it's more of a hindrance in my opinion as, when adjusted for flushness, the mitre gauge no longer fits in the slot designated for it on the side of the cabinet. So with that disappointment over, the mitre gauge itself is okay. It has positive stops at common angles which are fully adjustable via the screws on the back. But to be fair, it does actually fit the slots better than most, with very minimal side to side play. So in my opinion, it's a basic but usable mitre gauge. Another nice design feature is the onboard storage for accessories like the fence, blade and spanner, blade guard, push stick, and the mitre gauge providing you wind those machine screws back in. There's even some hooks for neatly wrapping up the power cable too. The cast iron table from front to back looked perfectly flat, or as close as I care to measure for flatness anyway. From side to side though there was a slight hollow at the front centre, it was equivalent to two layers of this paper, which measured 0.22mm. The insert plate that comes with the saw is metal, it has a hook that slots under the table at the back for safety, and four adjustable screws to get it flush to the table, plus a magnet at the front to hold it in place. The insert also has holes in it to enable you to adjust the screws while the plate is fitted, however two of those holes on my insert plate were drilled in correctly meaning I had to keep removing the insert plate to make adjustments. It'd be an easy fix to drill these holes out and make them bigger, but realistically I don't see myself using this insert plate much anyway, I prefer to use my own zero clearance plates for cleaner cuts. I can see that making zero clearance insert plates for this saw might be a bit tricky though, as the edges will need to be really thin material to sit on the ridge that supports the plate. The design of this insert plate once again is superior to that of the Axminster saw, which secures down with tiny machine screws that are very easy to lose, and this makes changing blades very annoying and time consuming. When I unwrapped the blade guard I was a bit confused as to why it came with batteries, and it turns out that this has a laser built into it, not a feature that I would ever use, or see any purpose for to be honest. It also comes with an anti-kickback pull, which fits to the riving knife behind the blade guard. The blade guard has a latch to secure it to the riving knife, but it didn't really feel like it latched on there reliably to me. There is adjustment for that via the nut on the side, and it did fix securely, but I think I'd have preferred a screw-on type fixing like a wing nut or a knob. The blade guard also seems unnecessarily large, and it might be something I would look to replace later as I might prefer something a little bit more basic and a little bit less intrusive, like the one on the Axminster, although I do like that this one is transparent. The blade on this one tilts away from the fence, which is another really good advantage over my Axminster, which tilts towards the fence. 
Tilting away from the fence is just much more sensible in terms of safety, and it means you don't have to fit the fence on the left hand side of the blade to safely make certain angled cuts. I was surprised to see that straight out of the box at full tilt the blade was at a perfect 45 degrees, and when I tilted the blade back to its starting position it was a perfect 90 too, no adjustments needed. The Axminster saw has these adjustable stop collars on the threaded rods so that you can dial in the perfect angles. The Lumberjack doesn't have this feature, but based on the readings from my digital angle box it doesn't need them either. The mobile base on the saw operates well, great manoeuvrability as all four wheels are swivel casters, but it does make a disconcerting clunk noise when you drop it to the ground. The manual provided with the saw is okay, it could definitely be better in places, but the diagrams are helpful and the instructions aren't too bad. So at this point I'd spent many hours setting everything up, fiddling around with things and filming it all of course, and I have to say I was getting almost exclusively good vibes from it. Once the review was done I certainly wasn't planning on keeping it, seeing as I already have what many would say is a more premium table saw. What I definitely didn't expect was for me to start thinking, Hmm, there certainly are a lot of things about the Lumberjack saw that are way better designed and nicer to use when compared with my Axminster saw. Some people would consider this saw to be a bit of a downgrade from what I'm using currently, but at this stage I didn't really see it like that. The build quality appears to be comparable. When I weigh up the features and design of the Lumberjack, it's preferable to the Axminster in almost every way. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I started feeling really quite fond of the Lumberjack saw, and that's a feeling that I never really got with my Axminster saw to be honest. But I hadn't even got around to turning the saw on yet, and unfortunately that's where things kind of went wrong. So the motor fired up but then stopped, and pressing the on button after that just did nothing. So I got in touch with my friend Sean at Sean in the Shed. He has this very saw and he made a couple of videos about it a few years ago. And more recently he's been working closely with Lumberjack Tools as a brand ambassador. Sean said to check the fuse in the plug, so I swapped out for another 13 amp fuse, plugged it in and powered it on, and it seemed to work fine. That was until the next day when I fired it up and it stopped working again. Another blown fuse. When I looked into this issue I found some more recent examples of people experiencing the same kind of electrical issues with this saw on the Woodworking UK Facebook group. So I contacted Lumberjack and told them what had happened, and they said that there was nothing wrong with my saw, but that the problem is due to the machine having a quick start motor, and they had a few suggestions for how to resolve this issue. One, I could upgrade the MCB for the circuit that the saw is running on from a B to a C. Two, I could run the saw off a long reel extension lead. Three, I could run it off a 16 amp circuit breaker. Or four, I could install a slow blow fuse. I have a 16 amp circuit in my workshop already, which is what my Axminster saw runs on, but I didn't fancy chopping the plug off my brand new saw and wiring in a new one, so I went online and ordered some 13 amp slow blow fuses. I hooked up my HVLP extractor to the port on the bottom and cut a piece of MDF. The first thing I noticed was just how little dust there was on the surface of the table. If I'd have made this cut on my Axminster without a separate extractor hooked up to the blade guard, there'd be dust everywhere. Next I cut through a 50mm piece of elm, and this is where I think I noticed that the Lumberjack seems to cut a little slower than the Axminster, perhaps not surprising as it has a 2.2kW motor whereas the Lumberjack has a 1.8. But still, I wanted to test out what kind of difference it makes while making a cut at what feels like an appropriate feed rate. This is a piece of 45mm thick sapili that I'm cutting through, and the Axminster was the winner here, making the cut 7 seconds quicker, that's 16% quicker. A noticeable difference, yes, but the Lumberjack didn't feel slow, nor does it feel like it lacks power when making a cut. Next I tested sound levels a distance of 1 meter. The Axminster has the quieter motor averaging around 62 decibels, with the Lumberjack averaging around 71. Both saws have induction motors and therefore both saws are quiet, but the Axminster has the edge. About two weeks have passed since I received the Lumberjack table saw. You'll see I swapped the crown guard over as I preferred the Axminster one, 
and I've now used it on four different projects and also every time I'm in my workshop, I tend to just turn it on multiple times just to make sure that it's still working and I haven't had any further issues, so those slow blow fuses seem to have done the trick. I do wonder why they don't fit slow blow fuses as standard though, as that seems like it would be an easy fix and less inconvenience for the customer too. But perhaps that's something that Lumberjack are looking to address going forward. I really like this table saw for all of the reasons that I've mentioned throughout this video, but when I factor in the additional advantages covered in the latter part of the video, like the more powerful and quieter motor on the Axminster, I'm left with a really difficult decision over which saw I want to keep going forward. Obviously I don't have space for both and I genuinely have not been able to make a decision yet about which saw to keep. And I'd be keen to hear any thoughts and suggestions that you might have. I'd like to thank Stuart from Proper DIY for his cameo and also for his skillful camera work. Sean in the shed for all his help and advice and Lumberjack for sending the saw out to me to review. Thanks for watching.